Johnny Dollar. Reed here at Floyd's of England. Georgie, how are you? I beg your pardon? George Reed, Floyd's of England? Oh, no, no, Mr. Dollar. No, this is Jeffrey Reed. I'm George's younger brother. Oh, I didn't know he had one. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. And what's more, I've taken over here in George's place, so to speak. Well, what's happened to him? Well, he's been reassigned to the Home Office back in London. Oh, I see. Yes, well-deserved promotion for him. He'll be in charge of all foreign business out of the Home Office, yes. <laughs> that big bum. Eh? I beg your pardon. I mean, for running off without telling me, without giving me a chance to throw him a farewell party or something. Oh, well, you see, it, it was quite sudden. Well, it must have been. George and I got to be pretty good friends, you know, over the years. We worked a lot of cases yes, together. Yes, yes, so he informed me. Uh, he also informed me, Mr. Some Dollar. of them were pretty wild, though, I must say, like the insurance on a pair of singing mice on stolen ambergris from a totally non-existent he, whale. He, he, oh, he also some pretty wild ones. I mean, you know, policies he never had any business issuing. So he's going back to old England, hmm? Uh, yes, he also informed me... Yes, yes, just a few days ago. Um, and as I Son started... Son of a gun, say, I'll miss the old boy. You know something, Jeffrey? Uh, please, Mr. He was Dollar. the only insurance man I ever knew... Who, oh, I'm sorry, I guess I have interrupted you, haven't I? Uh, he also... Uh, George, that is... Also informed me that if I were to run into any difficulties that... Uh, well, uh, of an unusual nature... That, yes? Uh, well, shall we say that shouldn't be called to the attention of the police, that I need never hesitate to call upon you. Uh-oh. What kind of crazy coverage has that company of yours given this time? It's a policy George wrote himself. Oh, then I shudder. And I dare say you can hardly call this one crazy, Mr. Dollar. Uh, that is, when you consider it will require paying out some hundred thousand of your American dollars. On what? On the life or I should say the return of a little child. Return of a ch... Oh, wait a minute. Are you talking about a kidnapping? Yes, I am. Well, have you called in the police, the FBI? Uh, no, definitely not. Why not? Uh, because the most explicit terms of the policy... What are you talking about? What's an insurance policy got to do with whether or not you bring in the proper authorities? Everything, Mr. Dollar. Don't you understand, Reed, that kidnapping is a federal offense? Listen, give me the names involved. I'll notify the FBI no, myself. No, no, no. That, that is the one thing you must not do. Now, listen to me. Now, please, please, Mr. Dollar, come over here and read the policy. Let me give you the facts of the case. I shall try to have the father over here to see and talk with you. And I think you'll change your mind about calling in the FBI. Well, that I doubt very much. But okay, Mr. Reed. I'll be there in a few minutes. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer and the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, North American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of... The Shifty Looker Matter. <laughs> Expense account item one. 4.30 for the inevitable tank full of gas. I always seem to find it empty when I have to use my car in a hurry. I drove downtown to Reed's office in the Spear Building. Jeffrey looked very much like his brother George, for whom I've handled so many investigations over the years, but he sounded far more British. Also, he seemed to have the knack of getting to the point by the longest possible way around. He also informed me, Mr. Dollar, that I should keep, shall we say, a rather weary eye on your expense account. Oh, yes, but... Uh, that it might tend to get somewhat out of hand on occasion. Well, let's not worry about that just now. And uh, I know, now that I've taken over this office, I uh, fully appreciate how you may feel about some of the policies George issued during his tenure of office here. And I'm afraid... Uh, this is one of them. Well, uh, suppose you tell me what the happened. The fact remains that by virtue of having written some of these, shall we say, rather unusual policies, 
He was able to build up the company's North American business to a wholly unprecedented extent. Yes, we, we know that, Jeffrey, but about this kidnapping... As a matter of fact, it was his outstanding record here that earned him the privilege of returning to the home office of... Uh, uh, Jeffrey, let's get to the business at hand, shall we? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, do you mind if I use the typical American familiarity and call you Johnny, as I understand George... You can call me anything you like if you'll only get to the point. <laughs> Very well. And uh, first, Johnny... I must insist that you read the terms of the policy covering the Looker child. Looker? Yes, just what it sounds like. L-O-O-K-E-R. Cynthia Looker. And her father's name is Stephen. Stephen Looker. Stephen Looker. Why do you say it that way? I'm not sure, really. Somewhere in the back of my mind... Ah, forget it. Now, what happened? Well, Mr. Looker and his child have residence at the old Wakefield Towers. He's retired, I understand. At least according to the policy. Looker, Looker. I beg your pardon? No, no, nothing. Go on. Well, he called me just before I called you. Uh, that is, I called you after checking over this policy, as he insists I do. Yes, well? It seems that he spent last evening up to the wee small hours with some friends, leaving his daughter, Cynthia, alone in the apartment. How old is Cynthia? Seven. Go on. When he returned early this morning, she was gone. Well, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that she was kidnapped. Oh, but I'm afraid it does, Johnny. Was there a ransom note? A ransom message, rather, on a tape recording device attached to his telephone. Demanding $100,000. I see. By some coincidence, that is exactly the amount specified in the policy. Now, uh, read it, please. He insured her specifically against kidnapping? It provides for immediate payment in cash, in unmarked bills of any amount up to and including $100,000 that may be demanded by the kidnappers. But look here, Jeff. It also states that under no circumstances are the press, the police, the FBI, or any other recognized law enforcement agency to be brought in until Mr. Looker has had ample opportunity to attempt payment of the ransom and, if possible, achieve return of the child. I told you it was unusual, Johnny. Unusual? It's highly illegal, too. Now, be that as it may, we are bound by its terms. Well, then why call me in? Well, fortunately, you are not one of the agencies of the law referred to. Why under the sun would George ever issue a policy like this? I told you, Johnny. Yes, you told me. When was it issued? Shortly after little Cynthia was born, which happened to be shortly after the Beeler kidnapping and the abduction and subsequent murder of the Hammerthwaite child. As you may remember, the Hammerthwaites refused to pay the ransom. Yes, I do remember them both. Well, can you blame Mr. Looker, then, for wanting such protection for Cynthia? Hmm. When is the money supposed to be paid? Did he tell you that? Yes, tonight. Where and how? I don't know. Where is Looker now? On his way over here to pick up the money? Yes, I have it all ready for him. But now, if he should find you here... Excuse me. Yes? Are Mr. Looker is here to see you, Mr. Reed? Well, well um... Uh, uh, just a moment, Sarah. Johnny, um... I, I work here. I, I'm the one who had to go out and pick up the cash. Oh, good. Uh, very well, Sarah. Send him in, please. Yes, sir. Also, Jeff. Yes? I'm the one who's going to try to keep that cash from ever being paid out. The terms of that policy notwithstanding. Well, now, look, Johnny. Oh, Hello. Come in, Mr. Looker. Come in. There was something familiar about Stephen Looker. I watched him and listened to him, the more I was sure of it. When Jeffrey Reed introduced me as an associate, he protested that it was a breach of the confidence stipulated in the insurance policy. But of course, it was too late to do anything about it. He simply warned me that if I, or Jeff either for that matter, if we made any attempt to contact the authorities, he'd have our heads, and I think he meant just exactly that. Because I know about those dirty, rotten kidnappings. I've read all about them, so have you. 
And you know what happens if you don't do exactly what they say. Well, uh, don't believe everything you read, Mr. Lecoeur. It's easy for you to say, Mr. Dollar, is it? Yes. Because it isn't your kit, but... I don't follow out their orders exactly in every way. They'll kill her. I, I know they will. Now, wait a minute. Wait, nothing. Cynthia's all I got in my life. She's the most wonderful kid alive. The, the sweetest, the prettiest, the most lovingest little. She's all I got, don't you understand? And neither you or anybody else is going to let them take her away from me. Mr. Looker, if you pay off once... Don't you know that they'll try it again? Not on me, they won't. Because I and Cynthia will be far away. You think I'd stay in a place like this, a country like this, after that? To look at... No. No. Don't try. Argue with me. It won't do any good. Just give me the money. Let me pay him off and get her back. Well, um... Of course, we are faced with the matter of proof. Proof? What are you talking about? Proof that she was actually kidnapped. What more kind of proof do you want than this? You said you got a tape machine here in your office, Mr. Reed? Yes, I have. Right over there. Then put it? this on and play it back for this, this doubting Thompson or whatever he calls himself. Play back this tape recording, and he'll see. <clears throat> Very well, I shall. Yeah. Go well, ahead. Yeah. Just take me a moment to get it warmed up and ready. Mr. Looker, why do you have your uh, phone conversations taped? Why not? Just a, a habit from the business I was in before I retired. Oh? What kind of business? Look... Can't you think of anything better to do than ask a lot of silly questions at a time like this? Well, it's something you'd rather not talk about. Okay. Okay, it was radio and electrical stuff and tape recorders, that sort of thing. I see. When my wife died, rest her soul, right after Cynthia was born, and we come here to live in peace, I wasn't working anymore. Well, any reason why I shouldn't rig up a gadget to answer the phone while I was out? And rig it so as it could take down a message for me? Does it also record conversations when you answer the phone? Sure, if if I wanted to. Why not? Uh, I just wondered. I mean, outside of a business where it might be wise to have orders or contracts or legal commitments recorded... I said I'm retired. The only reason I can think of for an individual would be if he expects to be threatened or something and wants a record of it for the police. Expects? I mean, suppose he had contacts with people of questionable reputation. What? All ready when you are, gentlemen. And go ahead and start the tape. You want it proof, Dollar. Now you'll get it. All ready? Right. Very well. Hello. This is a recording. Hello. I'm not in right now, but any message you want to leave will be kept on tape for me when I get back. Go right ahead with your message. Well, that's real good. So listen, Mr. Looker. We got your baby, your little Cynthia. She's okay, she's alive and comfortable. The kidnapper, Johnny. Now, Wait, sir. You do exactly what we tell you to, you'll get her back again tonight. You don't, you'll never see her alive. Now, all you gotta do is this. Get all of 100 G's unmarked. You get that? Unmarked. And when you turn it over to us, we turn over the kit to you. We'll even let you get a look at her a couple of seconds before you hand us the money so you'll know we're on the level and she's okay. Well, at least they... Uh, but I want to warn you. Deliver the dough alone and don't try anything funny. If you call on the cops or anybody else, all you'll ever see is a dead body. They would. They'd so kill my little girl. Wait, Mr. All you got to do is this. Tonight, Mr. Looker. Tonight. Tomorrow's going to be too late. You put the dough in a regular paper bag, See? And exactly 11 o'clock no, at night... stop the machine. Bring it to the... I'm taking no chances that you or anybody else can interfere. He, he, he does have a point there, Johnny. If anyone interferes... You bet I got the point. All right. But, of course, the tape will have to be left here as evidence, Mr. Looker. After I Boy, paid over the money. <laughs> after I got my Cynthia back, then you can have it. 
Then if you want somebody to try and chase down these dirty crooks, that's up to you. But not until I get my little girl back. Well, now, when you do get her back, since we are paying out all this money, you must let me know immediately. Don't you worry. The second I get her back to the apartment, I'll call you. I'll have her talk to you, so you'll be sure. That's the Wakefield Tower. That's right. Good. They uh, have a switchboard there. What's the difference? Well, as long as you make the call from there, from your own apartment, there'll be a record of it. Splendid. And that will suffice for the evidence we'll need before we call in the police. Okay. I'll do it just like you say. Now, give me the money. And the both of you better pray a little bit. As soon as he left us, I took off after him. On what proved to be the most unsuccessful tailing job you ever heard of. Within less than five minutes, I'd lost him completely. And why? Because he must have known it. He must have been afraid of what might happen to his daughter if somebody else tagged along with him. Or was it? Because it was just about then, a little bell in the back of my head suddenly rang out loud and clear. Steve Looker. Shifty Looker. To make sure, I passed up a couple of red lights to get to the public library before it closed. There in the old newspaper files, I found it. A story from September of 1954, Dateline, Chicago. When they rounded up the old Maroney mob and took him to trial, only one man got off without a prison term. The one they called Shifty Looker, alleged to be the man who kept his pals informed about the cops by means of a clever, elaborate radio hookup, who jammed the police radio frequency whenever the gang was pulling a job. He got off the hook because he turned state's evidence, but Maroney, who drew a seven-year stretch, swore he'd get even. And Maroney had also been suspected of kidnapping. By the time I walked out of that library, the bell in the back of my brain was clanging like a fire alarm. Item two, a dime for a call to police headquarters. Maroney? Stinky Maroney? That's right, Lieutenant. Sure, you had a little organization out in Chicago. Yes, I know. Drew a seven-year stretch. Do you know if he's out? Well, I can check on it, Johnny. Might take me a couple of hours, though. Lieutenant, I'll be sitting on your doorstep. If you ever suffer a touch of arthritis or rheumatism and you've never tried mentholatum deep heating rub you can't know how good its deep heating action can make you feel. As you massage it into painful areas, you feel its deep heating action. You know relief is on its way. Mentholatum deep heating rub is an extra strong combination of active ingredients for safe, temporary relief of minor arthritic rheumatic pain. Use greaseless, stainless mentholatum deep heating rub often. <laughs> Well, Lieutenant, you know me, I've been staring at that teletype machine out there until I can't see straight. Still no word. Come on, boy. Sure you don't want to tell me what this is all about? Sorry, Lieutenant. Now, wait. Wait a minute. Are you thinking maybe Maroney might have some reason for coming here to Hartford? I didn't say that. Now, listen, Johnny, we've known each other too long. If you think that maybe Maroney has some reason for... Oh, now, hold the phone. What's that supposed to mean? Do you by any chance just happen to know that one of his ex-pals just happens to be living here now? No kidding. Huh. That didn't sound very convincing, Johnny. I don't know why not. But his name is Stephen Looker, you know him? Looker? Looker, Looker, should I? Mm. The one member of the mob that got off scot-free. Been here for years now, behaving like an angel. He and his little girl. So we haven't bothered him. But. Yeah, but what? Maroney had a grudge against him. Swore he'd get him. So? You know the worst thing Maroney could possibly do to Steve Looker? Should I? 
Well, if you really don't know him, I guess not. But I'll tell you, Johnny, the worst thing would be for him to harm that little girl. Money? No. Looker hasn't got much. But if one hair of his little girl's head is touched... Listen, he's been a mother and a father and everything else to that pretty little kid. And like I say, he's kept his nose clean here in Hartford. So if Maroney is out... Okay, I know what I'm going to do. What, Lieutenant? Put a 24-hour watch over Steve Looker and the kid beginning right now. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What for? Conroy! Conroy, Will you take it easy for a minute? Oh, you mean that's why you're so concerned about Maroney? I didn't say that. Then I'm saying it. Of course it is. But it's a police matter, Johnny. Listen, Lieutenant. So you just leave it up to me. Conroy! You call me, Lieutenant? Yeah? Come in here. Right, sir. Oh, and here's the telly you were waiting oh, for. Let me see it. Oh. And, uh, what do you want me for, Lieutenant? Are you, Conroy, another thing. Not yet, that is. Not for a couple of weeks. So relax. Huh? The teletype, Lieutenant. Johnny, you can relax, too. What do you mean? Your friend Maloney doesn't get out of the pen until the first of next month. Oh. Yeah. Okay, Conroy, that's all. Yes, sir. Yes, Johnny, you can just relax for two solid weeks. Mm. I guess that teletype knocks a theory of mine. It... Oh, smoke, how blind can I be? Now, now, now listen, Johnny. I'll see you later. Blind is right. Was it Maroney's imminent release from prison that gave him the idea? Or was it something that he planned all along? And now that Maroney was getting out, he was afraid to wait any longer. Anyhow, it all added up, and much too well. Steve Looker had no money. So how could a kidnapper expect him, expect anybody to come up with a hundred grand in less than 24 hours? Unless he knew about that insurance policy. But that policy was a deep, dark secret. Yet by some coincidence, that ransom message demanded just exactly a hundred G's. Coincidence? And his defensive attitude when he found me there in Jeffrey's office. Of course, he must have known who and what I am. As for his crack that after this was over, he and the youngster would be far, far away. Oh, you bet they would with a hundred thousand bucks in his kick. I didn't know where he'd hidden his child, away from his apartment for the day. I didn't care. I didn't know whose voice he'd used on the tape recording. I didn't care about that either. But to carry it off without creating suspicion, he would have to make that phone call to Jeff after 11 o'clock from his own apartment so that it would be on record. It also meant that he wouldn't dare pick up Cynthia and take her there until after 11. I tore on over to the Wakefield Towers, took the elevator up to his floor, and then... Yes? Who is it? Uh, special delivery, Mr. Looker. Just to look at those handbags you're so busy packing. Wait a minute, Donna. I told you I and the kid are going to get away from here as soon as I get her back. I'm sure you would, too, with the 100000 if you could. Now, just let's have a look at these bags, hmm? You're crazy, Donna. That 100000 is to pay off the ransom. Is it? Shifty? Shifty. And what's it doing so carefully stashed away? Oh, I see. Yeah, you see, Donna. This thing has a silencer on it. You think I didn't know who you are this afternoon? What you were doing there? Think I wouldn't be ready and waiting for you? And you still thought you could get away with this? You huh? bet I do. First, I give you one nice slug between the eyes. Right? Just we... drop it, Shifty. Cops. That's right, cops. Lots of them. Gonna drop it, Shifty? Oh, sure, sure. I will. Okay, boys, take him out of the car. Hey, come on, uh, carefully. Right. Watch it. Go on. Watch well, it. what brought you here, Lieutenant? Oh, you didn't spot the tail I put on you when you left headquarters. Oh, no, I, uh, I guess I didn't. Oh, you're slipping, Johnny. Yeah, but I'm glad you did. Thanks. Pleasure. <laughs> Well, let's see now. Expense account total is exactly uh, $4.40. Okay, Jeffrey, it's perfectly all right. 
as long as you don't forget my commission on just exactly 100,000 clams. Not bad, hmm? For a single day's work? I'll take it any time. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, one of the cleverest, most diabolical weapons for murder I've ever seen. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Court Benson as Reed, Roger DeCoven as Steve Looker, Carl Frank as the police lieutenant, Ellen Manson as the voice on the tape, Guy Rep as Conroy, and Barbara Kassar as Sarah. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is our Hannah speaking.